and I'm glad to see that at least not not most of you were uh, so sick of me that you couldn't make it to this morning. So uh, I appreciate that. Uh, so yeah, uh, as Don said, uh, I'm going to be talking about combining radial velocities and transit. So on, on Monday, we talked about transits. On Tuesday, we talked about radial velocities. Uh, uh, on the hands-on session, we talked about fitting transits and radial velocities. And now we're going to go into uh, why you want to do that together. What's the motivation for uh, having both of these? OK, so this is just an animation of the transit that I've shown several times already. And to the right of that is an animation of a radial velocity curve on the bottom and uh, a, a top-down view of the orbit on the top. So you can kind of see there it goes in time. And now you're, I'm varying the, the eccentricity and the, the argument of periastron. So you can kind of see what effect that has on the orbit. I'll go into a little bit more detail on that uh, later. So I won't dwell on that now. <clears throat> OK, but first, as, as a way of motivation, you've seen plots like this several times. But uh, this black line here is all planets uh, that we've discovered as a function of, of year. So the first planet was discovered in 1989, although it wasn't called a planet then. But, um, but then since then, we've discovered uh, almost 4,000 planets. And the vast majority of them have been, at the beginning, it was almost all radial velocities. That's kind of petered off as, as we've used transits to detect, to detect them and then radial velocities to confirm them. Uh, but the vast majority of these planets have been discovered with either radial velocities in red or in transits in green. Uh, and then everything else, microlensing, direct imaging, um, pulsar timing, uh, is in blue here. So you can see there's, there's a strong motivation to be able to look or to, to try to combine those two most prolific uh, transit detection methods or planet detection methods uh, in one global sense. And so this is just a log plot of the same thing. So maybe that's a little easier for you to understand, or maybe it's a little harder for you to understand. But uh, whichever it is, you can pay attention to the one you like. Linear log. All right. Okay. Uh, oh yes, and this is uh, th another plot that you've already seen before. This is just now plotted in in uh, parameter space where you see uh, the period and the and the mass. Uh, and you can see that almost all of these points here are green transits, red radial velocity. Uh, and you can see the strong selection effect here. So the transits are, are biased towards short, shorter periods, uh, but they can kind of go to a little bit lower masses. Uh, the, the radial velocities can go to slightly longer periods, but there's this cutoff at about one meter per second here uh, that makes it really hard to, to do much better. But again, you, you don't see in the, the pink points, the direct imaging planets are a little bit hard to, to disentangle from the red points, but uh, but by and large, the impression I want to give you is there's a lot of radial velocity planets. There's a lot of transit planets. We should, we should do something with that. OK. Uh, so this is the, the plot that I showed in the beginning. Uh, and this is just, again, the uh, orbit. It's going to take one orbit around just to sort of show you. And, and this, is, this is over time. And now I'm just varying the orbital elements, the argument of periastron and the eccentricity. So it's going to step in eccentricity. And then it's going to cycle through all of the uh, values of the argument of periastron. So you can just kind of see that when it's a circular orbit, uh, it's it's a nice sinusoidal curve. Uh, but when it's a when it's um, east, east eccentric, uh, it it gets a little peaky like that. And then the the uh, argument of periastron kind of sh changes its phase. And then when it's, a, it's eccentric, it can also have some other effects. Okay. So first, I just want to remind everybody what uh, what you get uh, when you have radial velocities only, or or why you might have radial velocities only. Uh, basically. Not, unfortunately, not every planet transits. Uh, there's a geometric effect that it has to be precisely aligned. And so the probability of transit is just uh, R star over A. Yeah, I guess that's uh, so the probability of an Earth-like transit is basically 1 in 200. Uh, the probability of a, of a Jupiter-like transit is basically 1, or a hot Jupiter-like transit is, is 1 in 10. But it gets worse and worse the longer the periods, or longer, longer out you go. Uh, just because of geometry. It has to be more precisely aligned, and that's a priori less likely. And there was some talk on maybe Monday or Tuesday about is there a preferential alignment in the galaxy? There's no evidence of any preferential alignment. It's, it's purely random, and so it's randomly distributed in cosine i. Uh, and that just means that, that the further out you go, the, the longer a is, the longer that lever arm is, the closer to perfectly aligned it has to be. And so it's just, it's not very likely. And what that means is the closest nearest by planets, like Proxima and B, are not transiting. And so if you really want to study those, those uh, closest planets, our nearest neighbors, you're going to have to deal with some that don't transit. And so that's just the way it is. So, and, and the other thing is that blind searches for, for transits is pretty time consuming. It takes a lot, of, a lot of time. You have to stare for years. Whereas if you do a targeted search uh, with radial velocity, you can 
plot that out pretty quickly on the order of, of the, the orbital period, which sometimes can be quite quick. Okay, so I'm going to take a, a little step back here and talk about parameterization, because this is, uh, this is important when you fit things, and then it's important when you um, combine different data sets uh, from different things. Um, so there are many different, so, so parameterization, uh, it's just a fancy term for uh, the, the variables that I define to de perfectly describe the, the model that I'm using. So in, uh, let's take the eccentricity and the argument of periastron for an example. So, uh, so eccentricity and argument, argument of periastron, those are two variables that describe the orbit of the, uh, of the planet. Uh, and a lot of people will parameterize them as a combination of E times the sine of, of the argument of periastron and E times the cosine of the argument of periastron. And it actually matters how you, how you parameterize these. In an MCMC algorithm, which is very common nowadays, um, you introduce uh, a linear or a, a uniform prior in the the, uh, the stepping parameters or the fitted parameters. And if you don't if you don't correct for that, or if you don't want that that parameter to be uniform, you can introduce biases in the results that you get. So if you imagine uh, throwing out throwing a bunch of random darts in in the parameter space e sine omega and e cosine omega you get this nice uniform distribution. That's exactly the, the prior for the MCMC algorithm. Uh, so you can see that's nice and uniform. I think I, I, I uh, let you all peek at the, next slide, or at the next little bit, but can anybody guess what, uh, what that translates to in E omega space? What kind of prior does this translate to in, in eccentricity? Just kind of think about it for a little bit. Um, anybody want to take a guess? So if you if you drew uh, or if, if you could point to e equals zero on that plot, where would it be? It'd be right smack dab in, dab in the middle, right? And uh, growing eccentricities would would be concentric rings around that. So this is actually eccentricity of one, this this large circle here. And so now, does that give you a better idea of what sort of prior you might introduce? Anyone want to take a guess now? So I'm throwing random dots here. I've got a lot more chance to hit an eccentricity of one, and I've got an almost zero chance of hitting an eccentricity of zero. So if you actually plot the, the if you translate this, this scatter plot here into a, the corresponding scatter plot in E omega space, you end up with this gradient here, and it's actually a linear gradient where there's almost no power at eccentricity of zero, and there's a ton of power at eccentricity of one. And that's ex almost exactly the opposite of what we expect for a transiting planet. And so that's that's really bad. You don't want to step in E cosine omega and E sine omega without correcting for that. And most people nowadays do that, but this was a problem in the beginning where people would step in E cosine omega and E sine omega, and they would then infer a much larger eccentricity, a non-zero eccentricity for things that we expected to be circular. And that has huge implications for, uh, for tidal circularization, for you might, if you see a, a small eccentricity on something that you expect to be tidally circularized, you might think there's another body in the system that's perturbing it. Uh, so it's really important that you get this, this eccentricity right. Uh, and so you, this can introduce a three sigma significant eccentricity just from this bias. So it's important to, to really think about the, the parameterizations that, you're ha that you have uh, and how they may impact your priors and how they may impact the, the posteriors that you infer out af after that. And so the, the common solution to this is to, to reparameterize it an e square root e sine omega and square root sine, uh, cosine omega. And to think about this a little bit more intuitively, uh, if, you, if you just think back to your eighth grade uh, trigonometry, uh, you just square, square these two and take the square root, and then the sine squared plus cosine squared omega is equal to one, that drops out and, and, and that just becomes uh, e, or e squared. Uh, you can do the same thing, and, that, and that's why you get this, this gradient. So there's there's an e squared term, you take the derivative, and that, that becomes a linear prior in e. If you do the same thing with, um, with square root e, you just get e, you take the derivative, you get a half, and, and that's, that's a nice uniform eccentricity. Okay, so the bottom line is, uh, and this is, this, is a, a, a more, this is now just like the posteriors that, that we showed in the, in the ExoFast uh, stuff, except this is now the prior. So uh, this is various different ways of, of parameterizing the eccentricity, like just stepping directly in E and, and omega, uh, or stepping in square root E uh, cosine omega and square root E sine omega, and this is now stepping in uh, E cosine omega and E sine omega. So it's just the same thing, but, but said a different way. So it's, it's just really important that you think about your priors and think about your parameterization 
you you want something that is intrinsically uniform in uh, physical space, uh, or you need to correct her prior to be physically uniform by either important sampling after the fact or um, by applying a weighting to your likelihood acceptance uh, during the during the run. Okay. Uh, so the other the other thing there's sort of a competing effect there is that you also want a, a, a parameterization that is not very covariant because this uh, is is very hard to sample uh, with a normal uh, MCMC algorithm, uh, whereas this is much harder. And again, you can imagine, uh, or, or sorry, that, that's much easier. You can imagine again just throwing darts at both of those those plots, uh, and you're much more likely to land in this one sigma confidence interval, this this inner contour in this plot, than you are to land in that one sigma con confidence interval in this plot. Uh, so, so the MCMC is just randomly throwing dots, uh, and it, it will reject any step outside of that, or roughly speaking, it will reject any step outside of that one sigma confidence interval. And so here, you're going to reject a ton of steps, uh, whereas here, you're going to accept a lot of steps, and that's just going to be a much more efficient way to do that. Uh, so there's, there's a competing effect here where you want a parameterization that's not covariant, but you also want a, a parameterization that's, that's realistic, uh, that, that imposes uniform priors. And so, uh, it's not always clear what those are, and, and it, it gets a little complicated. Uh, but in general, most people for radio velocities have uh, agreed that the parameterizations for uh, radio velocities are uh, the period, P, the TC, uh, the, the time of transit or time of conjunction, or, or basically just a phase shift. You can parameterize that. Some people parameterize it in, in uh, the time of Harry Astron. Um, that's, that's generally, in fact, I showed exactly that here. That's, that's generally not a good idea because that's highly covariant with omega, so it's much better to, to uh, parameterize it in, in the time of conjunction. Uh, and I already talked about E sine omega and E cosine, or square root E sine omega, square root E cosine omega. Uh, and then the RV semi-amplitude K, that's just the, the uh, height of the radio velocity curve. And then this gamma factor is the, the baseline shift of that radio velocity curve. And this K here is, is really the important thing that we, that we mostly care about. And that's this complicated factor here that, that you can think of uh, that gives you the M sine I, the minimum mass. So from, from just the radio velocities alone, you get uh, these, these nice physical quantities, the period and the eccentricity of the, of the, of the planet. Uh, and those are useful in their own right. So you, can, you can do uh, evolution. Uh, you can do uh, just distribution, statistics, that sort of stuff. And then if you add the stellar mass in this, uh, you can also derive uh, A, the semi-major axis, through, uh, uh, through Kepler's law, and you can actually derive, you, you, you have to have a, a stellar mass here uh, to derive M sine I. So you don't have to do that simultaneously uh, because there's really no, no feedback, there's no improvement uh, in the, the con constraint from the radial velocity if you include the stellar mass, but you have to do it eventually in order to derive the, the parameter that you care most about, that's M sine I. So, you might as well, or, or you can do it after the fact, but uh, it's, I'm, I'm going to argue that, that you should go ahead and, despite the bullet, model the star now, and you can do it simultaneously, especially if you're going to model the transits. But all that's a fairly uncontroversial. Um, okay, so this is another uh, sort of different kind of plot, uh, but, but similar to the first one, where now I'm showing this is the star to scale with the orbit. Uh, this is a typical hot Jupiter. So this is, again, a, a top-down view of the star and its orbit. And this red, red bit of the orbit, if you can tell, uh, is highlighted because it transits like this. So you're up here viewing this way. Uh, and this is the corresponding radio velocity curve. Uh, so you can see, somebody asked a couple of days ago that uh, does it do Rossner McLaughlin? Uh, this is the Rossner McLaughlin effect there. I won't go into too much detail on that because it's not super critical. Uh, but you can see that there, it's transiting. Um, and, and then this is just a list of some of the parameters here. And I'm going to vary um, the inclination uh, here. And so you can see the important thing here is that uh, nothing really changes with the radio velocity curve. You, you see that, that Rossner McLaughlin dip uh, uh, leave, but we're actually changing the inclination quite a bit. And this radio velocity curve is identical. Uh, but you can see that the mass is increasing. So to compensate, so I observe this radio velocity curve. Uh, and I don't know if, if it's an, an edge-on inclination at a small, small planet or a face-on uh, transit or a face-on orbit that's a much higher mass. And, and that's just a fundamental problem with the radial velocity method. You just don't know 
uh, you, you just measure the minimum mass. Now, fortunately, geometry is such that, uh, again, it's, it's distributed in cosine i, and that really biases you more toward uh, relatively low masses, but it could, in principle, be arbitrarily high if it was arbitrarily close to face on. It's just a priori unlikely. And then I'm gonna, uh, this, this top plot here is the corresponding transit for that same, same thing, and now you can see it's just a flat line for most of it. But at the beginning here, uh, where it's right, right very close to edge on, you see that big transit depth, and that's just a great way to break that degeneracy. Uh, so if it does happen to transit, you know immediately what the mass, or what the inclination is, and then you know what the mass is. So that's a great uh, synergy there between the, the radio velocities and the transit. Okay, this one is a lot more complicated. Uh, fitting a transit only. Uh, there's a lot of reasons that you would do this, uh, and most importantly, RVs are expensive. Uh, they, they require a lot of big glass, you have to require a, a very expensive uh, instrument, and it requires a big team to run that instrument and, and write that pipeline. Uh, and so it's, it's a very expensive thing to take a radio velocity uh, data point. Uh, in addition, especially with the advances of, of Kepler and K2, a lot of the hosts are just too faint to do radio velocities. Um, and there's, there's, uh, there's just too many of them. Um, the, and, and sometimes the, the smallest planets are just too small. If, if the signal that we expect is less than a meter per second, it's gonna be pretty dicey to, to do this. So there's a lot of reasons that you might just have a transit only. And this, uh, this gets complicated for reasons that I will explain now. So again, you have uh, various ways that um, that you can parameterize the transit. And, and this one, there's no really good universal uh, method that people have, have uh, settled on. So some people, um, so uh, Raphael talked about the box least squares and you can, you can parameterize this transit as just a box. So not even a sloped edge, but just a box. And that requires five parameters. The, the center of, the, of that box, the, the transit time, the period, the, so the frequency of, of the, the dip, uh, this capital T, which is the, the full width half maximum, or the, the, the transit duration at the midpoint here, uh, the F naught, which is the, the baseline flux, and this delta, which is the, the depth of the flux, or the, the depth of the dip. Um, and that's, that's a pretty decent way to do it. It's, 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 you can kind of translate to physical parameters, uh, but it's a little better if you also include uh, this tau term, which is the, the time of ingress and egress. And then you can get a better idea. That, that, that then gives you an idea of the inclination of the system. Uh, you can kind of work these out, but it's pretty, still pretty degenerate. Uh, so now I'm gonna throw up a bunch more symbols here. Try not to get uh, 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 phase out too much. We'll go slow. Um, okay, so you can, you can also uh, do this more physically motivated. And so rather than just times, you can, you can parameterize it in, in the same physical parameters, the same sort of parameters that we uh, pr parameterize the uh, radio velocities. So in particular, uh, cosine i, we, we want that to be uniform, so that's a good, uh, because that's what we a priori expect from, from geometry. Um, so that's a good stepping parameter to, to step in. Uh, we have the same period and, and, and time of transit. This rp over r star is, is just the square root of the depth. Uh, so that's the, the depth ratio. Uh, we, we have the same factor of the, the baseline flux, and then we also have these U1 and U2 that are the uh, limb darkening parameters. So that adds some, some curvature, some geometry, or some, some real life uh, shading to the, to the transit. And then finally, we have this, this A over R star term that's, um, that's basically the, the duration of the transit in, in a more physical sort of uh, method. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, that's, that's a little too simple uh, because the, the duration of the transit actually depends on the eccentricity as well. Uh, and so if you really want to model a physical transit, you need to include the same E cosine omega and E sine omega term. Uh, so here I've just, I've just added these, these additional two terms. Uh, but really, there's, there's this added complication, and this is where, where it really, uh, you really need to think about it, and, and you really need to, um, to, to take a step back and say, what do I, wanna, what do I want out of this system? And you want, uh, the best parameters that you can get. And, and if you don't use Kepler's law, you are ignoring a, a very robust, very good constraint. And you can only use Kepler's law if you include the eccentricity or assume the eccentricity and you include the mass and radius of the star because that then allows you to, uh, you have a period 
uh, you can you have the mass of the star, then you can calculate A, uh, and then you have the radius of the star, and then you can derive A over R star. If you only do uh, this parameterization and you don't include the mass of the star or the radius of the star, then you have no way to link the period and, and this A uh, because you don't know the mass. And so then those are decoupled and uh, you, you don't have that very powerful constraint, especially now that Gaia is out uh, and we know a priori the, the radius of the star that's very to a very high precision. Uh, this matters a lot. You can, you can basically eliminate this free parameter, this A over R star. You can just calculate it now and that, that's going to be a huge advance uh, in, in being able to constrain the rest of the parameters. Okay, so you've seen this, this plot a lot. I, I hope you already understand it, but just in case you don't, uh, I, will, I will explain it. So now you're seeing the, uh, the face of the star uh, with the planet going across it uh, like this. And if you look really closely, you can actually see uh, it arcing a little bit by, by a couple pixels or something. Uh, so that's actually the projected orbit uh, onto uh, the, the plane of the star. And so if you, if you just drew a straight line across the star, uh, you would actually get a slightly different answer in the egress and e ingress time compared to actually computing the full Keplerian orbit uh, and then uh, calculating the projected, um, the projected separation at the face of the star. <clears throat> and then since we can't actually, we, we don't have that sort of resolution on the sky, we actually, what we just monitor is the uh, light from the star, the integrated flux from the star, and that's what you're seeing here. So you just see as the, as the planet uh, covers part of the star, it dips down uh, and so on. Okay, so now I'm gonna do the same sort of thing, except now I'm, I'm uh, the, star, or the, the planet is still going like across like it did before, but now I'm taking a snapshot right in the middle of the transit and I'm gonna vary a few, few different parameters. So here I'm varying uh, RP over R star. So I'm just making the planet bigger. Uh, and you can see that, not surprisingly, the, the transit depth gets, gets deeper. So planet gets bigger, transit depth gets, gets deeper. Uh, I hope that is clear, because it's gonna get more complicated. Okay, so then uh, what you can also look at is you can change the inclination of the orbit. So everything else is fixed. Uh, this, is, this is for uh, standard hot Jupiter. This is in fact HD 189733. And if I just change the inclination from a, a grazing geometry to a central crossing geometry, you can see it, it, at a central crossing it gets very flat. Uh, and at the grazing, you can see that V-like transit. And so that's what we're, we're actually measuring when we measure the, the inclination of the transit. So just, uh, I'll give a couple people a few minutes to, uh, or a couple, a couple seconds to uh, see that. So you can see the, the flattening there, still the curvature because you've got the, the uh, limb darkening. And when it started out, when it was grazing, it's very V-shaped. V so that's, that's basically what you're looking for. When you, or that's what the, the model is, is refining when you're, uh, fitting for the, the inclination. Okay, but you can also change A over R star. I said the duration of the transit uh, depends on A over R star. So as you, as you vary A over R star, uh, you, so one, one striking thing to see here is that uh, it looks a lot like the inclination. It's going up. Does anybody know why that might be? Yeah, go ahead. Did you? Exactly, so it's just a probability. So you go further out, you've got the longer lever arm, and so the projected uh, distance onto the face of the star is is larger, so you have a larger impact parameter for the same uh, same inclination. So uh, in reality, I'm I'm also so as I change a over r star, I'm actually changing the period of the planet uh, to correspond with Kepler's law, so that I'm actually around the same star. That's not very realistic when you're observing transits. You actually know uh, the period very well usually uh, because you see more than one transits, and, and you really really know the the period very precisely. So what happens? If I now just fix the period, so now the, the period is fixed, but now I'm changing A over R star, uh, and I'm uh, and I'm, I'm I'm basically changing uh, tau, uh, the the ingress and egress time. So I'm changing A over R star, and I'm changing the inclination to compensate. And I'm actually even changing the depth a little bit uh, here, and and so now this is a much more subtle change. You just see a slight change in the slope here uh, of the ingress and egress, and so you can see it getting a little bit more grazing, and it, it's a little bit more V-shaped. So this is really uh, what you're constraining. If you have, if you're not using the the radius or the stellar density constraint on a transit, this is really the the meat of what you're constraining. You're you're constraining this degenerate quantity between a over r star and i by the the shape, the detailed shape of this ingress and egress. Okay, but if you have the uh, the the uh, density of the star, it becomes you you basically fix a over r star again, 
and it becomes exactly like that, that first example or the second example that I showed you where you're just changing inclination. So this is really powerful uh, to, to a priori know the, the density of the star because it tells you, uh, or because it breaks that degeneracy between A over R star and I, and so you can get a, you can get a much bigger handle on the inclination, a, a much more precise measurement of the, of the inclination because that is a much bigger change than this. You can just see by eye that, that if, you, if you're not really closely paying attention, you might not even see that it's changing, whereas here you can see a huge change. Okay. Uh, and then lastly, uh, this is what happens when you change the, the, the limb darkening, so the shading of the star. So if you just cycle through that, you can see that this, this rounding gets a little bit more um, pronounced. And so that's a function of the stellar parameters, and it's also a function of the, the bands that you observe. So the bluer the bands you get, the, the more rounded this is. The redder you, you observe in, the, the uh, flatter it is. So this is like an IR transit, and this is like a, a B band transit here. Okay, so now that, now that we've gone through that, uh, how do you parameterize uh, the, the transit? So I'm gonna go with the physical one, uh, which is this set of parameters, including the mass and radius of the star, so that then I can use Kepler's law. Uh, and, and with those, I can derive the period and the inclination. And if I have the, the stellar parameters, M star and R star, I can derive the, the planetary radius, because that, that's the depth, but scaled by the, by the radius of the star. And I can derive the, the semi-major axis from, from the mass of the star through Kepler's law. So those are interesting in their own, right? Um, uh, and, uh, and, and, but, but really, uh, I, I really, really want to include Kepler's law. And so I'm, I'm, going to, uh, I'm going to include those M star and R star during the model, even though it adds a significant layer of complication. Now I add an SED, I add isochrones to the model. Uh, it, it adds a significant layer to the layer of complication to, to the modeling, but it's really worth it because you can now use Kepler's law to constrain o A over R star and then uh, effectively uh, the inclination and, and other things. Okay, but again, uh, I talked about the eccentricity. Uh, you, you need the eccentricity to, to be able to model this, and I, I glossed over this yesterday, or on Monday, uh, and, and, and I, I, guess I, I guess I lied to you. So yesterday I showed you this plot here, or this, this slide here, and I was deriving, this is how you get the stellar density from the, uh, from the transit. Uh, can anybody spot, in fact, I lied to you twice on this slide. Can anybody spot either of those uh, lies? So the first is, uh, it's, a, it's a minor lie, but, but Kepler's law is not actually this. It includes uh, the mass of the star, or the mass of the planet. Oops. Oh, I, I, I spoiled it. Uh, so uh, that, is, that it includes the mass of the planet. Mostly, that's not uh, that important. Uh, it's, it, it changes a few things, but you can really just ignore it. So uh, I'm going to basically continue to do that. Uh, but you can, if you have the radial velocities, you, you can include that term and, and do it precisely. As long as the the planet is is Jupiter mass or lower, uh, it's it's perfectly fine to ignore that. Okay. Can anybody spot the other lie? <laughs> okay. So the other lie, of course. Uh, that I spoiled it, uh, is that A over R star is observable. It is not actually the duration of the transit. Uh, it's a little bit grosser than that. Okay, so the first one, if I, if I fix that, uh, this is actually Kepler's law. And if you propagate that math in there, it's, it's not very hard algebra, but it's a little bit harder to, uh, to explain uh, on the fly on the, on the screen. But it basically adds this term here, RP over R star cubed times the density of the planet. That is almost always very small. So we'll just ignore that. Not a big deal. Uh, but this other one is quite a bit more important. So you don't actually observe A over R star. You observe this quantity A over R star times the square root of one minus E squared over one plus E sine omega. Gross. That is disgusting. Okay, so if we don't know what the eccentricity is, how do we actually constrain over A over R star? Ugh. Ugh. It's gross. Okay, so that brings me to eccentricity. That's why transit fitting by itself is gross. Okay, so here is that same plot that I showed before. You've got the face on, or the, the top down view of the, of the planet and the transit, uh, and this is the, the corresponding transit. And now I'm gonna step through uh, eccentricity and argument of periastron, just like in that, in that um, omega, or the, the RV plot, and, uh, and we're gonna see what impact it has on the transit. Okay, so you can see as we step through uh, in, in Ethan, so I'm stepping in eccentricity and then I'm stepping through uh, argument of periastron. Uh, 
and I take a step in eccentricity and cycle through our unit of periastron. And you can see that this transit shape changes quite a bit as you do that. And that's just because you're changing the, the velocity during transit. And so if you're at uh, periastron, it's going to whip past uh, the transit and it's going to be very, very short. And if you're at apastron, it's going to go very slow and the transit's going to take a long time to actually progress through. So wait a minute. Uh, I said that uh, you can't measure the eccentricity and the argument of periastron from the transit. Uh, what gives? If it changes the, 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 uh, the duration, then obviously you can measure it, right? Well, you can, kind of. Uh, so if you plot uh, the, the contours in E sine omega square, or square root of E sine omega and square root of E cosine omega, and, and now in equal contours of this, of this quantity that we actually measure, that's the density, uh, if you, if you think of a typical uncertainty on this quantity that you can measure from a typical Kepler-like light curve, uh, you actually get this, uh, the, the spot that's bounded by these, the red contours. So you get sort of like a mustache look here, a nice Fu Manchu. Um, so, so you can actually eliminate quite a bit of, of parameter space. You eliminate this whole region, you eliminate that whole region, uh, and, and that's quite a bit of parameter space, unfortunately. Uh, I don't think any E cosine omega space and E sine omega space. So uh, I'm going to translate that again to E and omega space here. Uh, and this is what it looks like in, in E omega space. And, and you can see that, ah, crap, I don't actually constrain the eccentricity at all. It can be anything from zero to one. Uh, and, and again, the argument of periastron can be anything from negative 180 to 180. So it's an angle that's anything. So you really haven't eliminated anything except combinations of things. Uh, but you can do a little better than that. Uh, just from, if I go back here, um, if you pay attention to the eccentricity here, you'll see that it never gets higher than, I think, 0.78 or 0.8-ish. So keep an eye on that, 0.78. Yeah, so it never gets higher than that. Why don't I go all the way up to 1? Anyone want to guess? It'll hit the star, yeah. So if you go any, any step beyond that, it'll actually collide with the star. And so you can actually remove quite a bit of that parameter space already. So I can just cut off this bit. And you can see that, that this bit is actually quite thin already. So if you took uh, a, a distribution, this is, this is now, you can think of it as, as now your prior based on the transit duration. Uh, you, if, you, if you plotted the eccentricity, a uh, histogram of this, the eccentricity would, would be far, far less likely to be a, a high eccentricity than a low eccentricity. And so that does actually carry some weight. And so you're, you, it would behoove you to marginalize over this, this, this de the degeneracy even though this is, this is what we call a diabolical degeneracy. This is actually horrendous to try to sample in an in, in MCMC. The affine invariant that, that MC uses and the, and the differential evolution that ExoFast uses are terrible at sampling this, this sort of degeneracy. And uh, I will, you can ask me about that later if you're, you're curious why. Uh, so now, just to sort of, because this, this might not really hit at home, uh, I, I like to think in nice animations. So now I'm doing this, this is the same plot, uh, except now I'm changing E and omega. You can see I'm, this is now an eccentricity of 0 0.8, 0 0.0. Uh, this is a huge change in the eccentricity in the argument of periastron, but there's basically no change in the, in the resulting transit light curve. If you look really closely, you can kind of see that there's a shift in, in the ingress and egress, a very, very slight shift, but you're not really that sensitive to it. Uh, so this is a disaster. Uh, and so now, just to sort of uh, lift off the veil, you can see uh, this is the corresponding, if, if you had a direct imaging or, or uh, something like that, uh, this is what you would see at, at top down. Uh, and, and that's a huge change in the orbit where you have no change in the uh, eccentricity. But if you have radial velocities, you get a huge change in the radial velocities as it, as it cycles through these. So you can break this degeneracy very, very quickly with just a few radial velocity points. Uh, so I want to take a little bit of a, a little bit of time to talk about the, the stellar density constraint uh, that you end up getting out of this, because uh, now that that I lied to you and you don't actually get the stellar density, uh, what you get. Uh, so if you compare the stellar density that you get from just uh, just nice mass over over volume uh, from third grade algebra uh, versus this this number that I gave you here, and you plug in instead of this r star over or a over r star that is actually the quantity that, that would give you uh, the, the density. If you 
modeled this, the transit as a circular orbit uh, and then called that A over R star, the, the actual quantity A over R star times that, that gross eccentricity um, factor, if you called that, if you instead called that A over R star, you'd get a different value for the, for the stellar density. And you'd end up, uh, if you compared the, the, the ratio of these two, you'd end up with a plot like this for all of the known exoplanets with, with sufficient information to calculate them from the exoplanet archive. And so this, this first bin here, this tall bin, fortunately, uh, that has about 300 planets, there's about 600 planets in total about this, about half of the planets are nice and in, in very good agreement. And this is about the, the agreement that you would expect from rounding error if you were actually self-consistently modeling the transit and the planet together, or, and the, the, the transit and the star together. Uh, but half of the planets, fully half of the planets, are, are outside of that, that rounding error. That means that they're modeled inconsistently, and that, that's because dealing with this eccentricity is hard. Sampling that, that degeneracy is hard, but you have to do it because otherwise you, you introduce this inconsistency here. And you, you have the, the information to actually constrain this, and you, you have the information to use this, this, uh, this row star to constrain the, the transit, uh, you just, it's a little bit messy. So you should, you should, uh, you should this, this plot should just be a, a huge spike at one, and it's, it's alarming that it's not. Okay. Okay, uh, so now, um, the other advantage is to having, uh, uh, or the, the, the other tough part about having just transits is that you really have no good way of, of confirming or validating the planet. So uh, you, you have, uh, sometimes you can do TTVs to confirm the planets, uh, but that really requires uh, multi-planet systems in semi-resonant configurations, and, and that's just intrinsically rare. Not, not many of the planets uh, are, are in such configurations that you can do that. The other um, thing you can use, is, as you've all uh, experimented with this week, is VESPA. You can validate it, uh, but it's not perfect. You, I think he said it was about 90% accurate, which is pretty good, but it's not as good as radial velocity. Uh, and when you do that, most of those parameters, or most of those uh, points in this plot here that aren't at zero come from VESPA-validated planets that have no eccentricity, that, or that, that have no modeled eccentricity, uh, but, but actually have probably some real eccentricity. Uh, so they're, the parameters that, that, you, that are in the published archive that, that everybody uses are actually biased by assuming the circular orbit. Uh, so, so yeah. So this is now the case for Kepler and K2, and it's going to be the case for tests because although they're going to be brighter, uh, there's just going to be so many of them. I, I think the, the latest estimates of the, of, the, of the yield from tests is that there's going to be 10,000 new planets. We just don't have the radial velocity resources to, to get a radial velocity orbit for all of those. So this is, this is actually kind of scary. Okay, so there is this, this nice uh, synergy between transits and radial velocities that uh, here is the uh, transit uh, parameters and here is the radial velocity parameters. And you can see immediately that I can just cross out the period and the, and the, the time of transit for the radial velocities. I can just remove those three parameters from, from the combined fit because the period is very, very precisely con con constrained by the uh, duration or the, the frequency of the transits and the time is very precisely constrained by the, by the time of the transit. And, and very fortunately, I can cross out E cosine omega and E sine omega from, from the transit uh, because those are very nicely constrained by the, by the radial velocities. And then I can also cross out the mass of the star here, which I would need anyway to derive M sine I, but now I, I need to model the, the uh, mass and radius of the star so that I can feed back into Kep and use Kepler's equation to feed back into uh, the constraint on the, on the, uh, uh, on the transit. So now I can derive all of these really cool, interesting physical quantities. I can actually get the mass of the star, I can get the radius of the star, uh, or of the planet. I, I can, just like I did before, I could get the period, the inclination, uh, the semi-major axis, the eccentricity, but now I can get the density of the planet. And that's really cool because the density tells us about the bulk composition. You can, if you have the mean density, you can actually say, you can start to say what this planet's made of. We, we now know it's rocky or it must have some hydrogen atmosphere or, or something like that. That's a really powerful statement that you can't get from radial velocities alone and you can't get from transits alone. You have to have radial velocities and transits to get that density. And then of course you can get the, the true mass of the planet because you can resolve that finite degeneracy. And then uh, I think I'm gonna skip this part. Uh, I'm gonna skip this too. Uh, I'm just gonna say really quick uh, that when you model the, the transits and the radial velocities together, um, you can now, uh, 
you, you, you should be mindful of your reference frame. So just like uh, in the in our own solar system, we have Julian date and we have very centric Julian date, and those differ by uh, by up to eight minutes. So this is a this is a very crude model of the the Earth orbiting the Sun at the center here, and this is a plane wave coming from your target way out there. Uh, so you can see that that this is the plane wave that as it arrives at the very center of the solar system, and this is the plane wave as it arrives on Earth. And so this blue line here is the difference in time that it takes between uh, between when it arrives on Earth and when it arrives at the very center. And this is basically, at, at that point there, it's, it's 1 AU over C, uh, the speed of light. So it takes eight, it's eight minutes delayed uh, here, and it's eight minutes ahead there. And that's a huge difference in time, and that's why we take into account the Julian date versus the very centric Julian date. But we have the exact same effect when we look at the transit in, in its own system. Uh, if we look at the, the primary transit, it's, it's ahead by its semi-major axis over C, and if we look at the secondary transit, it's behind by its semi-major axis over C. And if we look at the radial velocities, compare the radial velocities and the transits, it's also the, the timestamps differ by A over C. Uh, and so that's all I'll say on that, because I'm already over time. Um, and, and this I just want to say real quick, even though I'm over time. Uh, this is, uh, this blew me away when I learned this, is that you can, uh, when you combine data sets, it's really just as simple as taking the data minus the model over the uncertainty for all of the data and all of the models. So you have a radial velocity data point, sure, add it to the chi-square. You have a transit data point, sure, add it to the chi-square. You've got a prior, add that to the chi-square. It's that simple. I, it just blew me away that it was that easy to, to combine these, these data sets. And so I will end there. All right, thank you. So you would need, oh yeah, sorry. Uh, so she, uh, Raphael says that uh, because you have this term, now you have some constraints on the mass and radius of, of the planet. Um, and since you have the, the radius of the planet from the transit, uh, can you use this to actually measure the mass of the planet? Uh, I've honestly, that's never occurred to me, so I'm gonna, gonna try to think this out on the fly. Um, <laughs> I, my, my instinct is that it would just need to be way too precise and, and that it would be very degenerate. And, and you would need, a, so in order to do this, uh, we're, we're sort of turning it around and using uh, the eccentricity and the period and, and everything else to constrain uh, this and, and, and A over R star. So you'd really need an independent measurement of A over R star, the eccentricity and the period to be able to turn this around and, and say that. And, and getting an eccentricity from radial velocities or anything that pre precise enough to get a uh, RP over R star cubed times the mass times that, uh, that seems really hard to me, but I would be interested if somebody wants to, wants to do that more rigorously because I'm just making it up right now. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so, so Andrew Vandenberg says, uh, Ben Monte has done it for a brown dwarf, but uh, it's basically very hard for a small planet. Thanks. Uh, yeah, it could certainly be that as well. Um, uh, sorry, yes, uh, so David said uh, on, the, on the plot that's showing the comparison between the transit density and the stellar density, could, could the stellar density just be wrong? Uh, yes, so that, that does include now better stellar densities. It does not include, at least as far as I know, the Exoplanet Archive as of, uh, I guess this was, the, I made that plot before DR2 even came out. So, so that does not include DR2. You might be able to remake that uh, using the DR2, uh, Gaia DR2 masses and radii uh, and do somewhat better, but 
but yeah, there's probably some uncertainties in, in the masses or the, the seller densities from the actual seller properties. But uh, I would expect that that error to be dominated by the by the transit. Uh, so the question is, can you use the, the bias that uh, a transit is more likely to happen at periastron uh, to constrain the eccentricity uh, in that very degenerate E cosine omega, E sine omega space? Uh, yes, um, it's not perfect. Uh, it will tend to, to downweight um, certain regions of parameter space. And, and that's, if, if you step in the correct parameters, then, then it will do that automatically. So the, the question is, uh, a lot of papers assume that, that the eccentricity is zero, and when is it safe to do that? So in general, we expect planets to be roughly circular, especially in, in, in multi-planet multi systems. Uh, but it's way, way, way better to just include an actual prior on the actual distribution of eccentricity that you, that you expect. So just do it. Uh, it's, it's, then, then you can incorporate that uncertainty rather than assume that it's circular. Uh, and, and bias your answer, and, and then not be able to use the Kepler's law to constrain it. So yes, a lot of people assume it's, it's circular. Uh, that's, that's not a good practice. 